As I slowly opened my eyes, I was surprised to find myself in a strange, unfamiliar bed. I quickly checked myself to make sure I was fully clothed and took a sigh of relief that I was. I noticed my bag sitting on the side table, so I checked it too to see if everything was in there, and luckily nothing was missing. As I opened my phone to see my current location, I was taken aback that I was in Barcelona. How in the world did I end up there? I wondered, trying to recollect the events of the previous night, but to no avail. That was when the door creaked open, and a tall, tanned, lean yet muscular man entered the room with a tray containing breakfast. I didn't know him, so I was cautious as he approached me. He opened his mouth and said good morning in a husky voice before asking me if I was okay. I nodded my head hesitantly and asked how I was there. Oh, I found you passed out on the street. I tried asking you where you lived, but since you couldn't talk and it wasn't safe leaving you there, I brought you to my home. But don't worry, I didn't do anything to you. He placed the tray on the table while saying that. A sense of relief washed over me upon hearing that, but what was weirder was that I did not remember drinking yesterday in the bar. I only had soft drinks, so it was strange that I passed out. Did someone spike my drink? The question lingered in my mind as I got from the bed and began preparing to leave the man's house. My head was throbbing as I gathered my belongings and asked him to show me the exit after thanking him. He didn't say much and simply led to the door. As I safely left his house, the doubt about that man being a pervert or someone dangerous lifted from my mind. However, I still wonder who it could be that spiked my drink and why. On my way home, I couldn't help but feel unprepared and a little downhearted that I hadn't done much to prepare for Christmas this year. With only two days left until the big day, I decided to take action and headed to Walmart to shop for some decorations and other festive items. I wanted to ensure that Christmas wouldn't be a bland and uneventful occasion for me, so I took my time browsing through the aisles, picking out the perfect decorations and all. It was important for me to make the most of the holiday season and not spend Christmas Eve sulking on my couch, drinking alone. As I was browsing the aisles of the store, searching for the items on my list, I suddenly felt a prickling sensation at the back of my neck. I turned around to see if anyone was staring at me, but that crowded store made it impossible to identify the culprit. Despite my unease, I continued to browse, hoping that the feeling would pass. However, as I made my way towards the checkout counter, I realized that the gaze was still following me. It made me feel uncomfortable and self-conscious, as if I was being judged by a stranger. I tried to shake off the feeling, but it lingered until I finally paid for my purchases and left the store. As I made my way back home from Walmart, I couldn't shake off the feeling that someone was watching me. It started as a faint sense of unease, but soon became full-blown paranoia that I was being followed. I quickened my pace, but the footsteps behind me seemed to match mine. Every time I turned around, there was no one there, but the feeling persisted. The closer I got to my apartment building, the more I felt like I was being stalked. I was on the edge as I fumbled my keys to unlock the front door, but as soon as I slipped inside the building, the feeling lifted. I breathed a sigh of relief that whoever it was that had followed me in, as the thought of them getting to my apartment filled me with dread. As soon as I entered my apartment, I felt a sense of relief. However, I was still paranoid, and my heart was racing. I quickly went to the bedroom and peeped through the window to see if the stalker was still outside. I was hoping to catch a glimpse of the person who was following me, but to my disappointment, there was no one there. I couldn't shake off the feeling that someone was out there waiting for the chance to attack me. I wondered if I was just being paranoid, and it was all just my mind playing tricks on me. But for some reason, deep down, I knew that my fears were not unfounded. I had no clue who spiked my drink at the bar, but I had a hunch that whoever was following me had something to do with it. My mind was racing with thoughts and questions. Who was this person following me? Why were they doing it? What did they want from me? I was scared, but I knew I had to be vigilant and stay alert. I couldn't let my guard down. On the day after I had put the Christmas decorations in my house, 
I realized that I had forgotten to purchase the snacks for the occasion. Although the thought of running into the stalker made me nervous, I decided to gather my courage and fetch my car keys. I stepped outside and carefully scanned my surroundings before making my way to the car. I was relieved when I saw no one following me, and so I hurriedly drove to Walmart. As I reached the entrance of the store, a strange sensation formed in the pit of my stomach. Just then, I felt a tap on my shoulder, causing me to jump in alarm. I turned around to see the man I was in the apartment of the day before standing behind me with a smile on his face. While I was grateful for his help, there was something about his presence that made me feel uneasy. Despite my apprehension, I tried to be polite and acknowledge him. What a coincidence! Do you live around here? He asked in a curious tone, but I didn't want to give him my address, so I simply nodded and excused myself before heading inside the store. However, he followed me inside, making me feel uneasy and following me to whatever aisle I went. It was weird enough that he was all the way here to shop from Barcelona, but putting up with him like that was nerve-wracking. After finally managing to shake him off, I paid for my purchases and made my way back home. However, as I turned toward the narrow road that led to my apartment building, I found a car blocking my way. I honked repeatedly, but the driver didn't budge, so I decided to get out of my car and approach the vehicle. I opened the car door and walked to the car's window before knocking on it. As the mirror was pulled down, I was shocked to see the man from before. He handed me a package, saying it was for me, but what was scarier was that I never told him where I live. How did you- I stuttered those words, and I started backing off. I was about to run back to my car, but everything happened so fast. He got out with a flash and put a damp cloth over my nose. His words before I blacked out were blurred, but I could hear it. It was fun seeing you so terrified. Hey guys, thanks so much for all the support. If you haven't subscribed to the channel yet, please feel free to do so. The unfortunate fate of having to work on Christmas had fallen upon me, but it wasn't just any ordinary work day. I had to wear a Santa elf costume and distribute presents to children. As an orphan, I never had a family to celebrate the holiday with, and after aging out of the foster system, I was forced to fend for myself. My life was consumed by work, and I never had the opportunity to make friends. Thus, I found myself alone on this day that held no significance to me. However, standing alongside the fake Santa and handing out gifts to children, I never anticipated that this Christmas would become a haunting memory. The clock struck late and I began my journey back home. Fatigue weighed heavily on my body as exhaustion took over. I suddenly felt a presence behind me and my uneasiness grew. I turned around to face an empty road and the darkness only added to my fear. It was nearly three in the morning and I couldn't shake off the feeling that something was amiss. I continued walking forward attempting to ignore the nagging sensation. As I walked, my lack of sleep caught up with me, and I yawned incessantly. At that moment, I heard another set of footsteps matching my rhythm. I turned around quickly, but there was no one in sight. The road seemed to stretch infinitely into the pitched black darkness beyond, and my heart began to race. I was alone, and yet I couldn't shake the feeling that I was being followed. My apartment was still a bit far and I was walking past a park in the neighborhood when I heard a clanking sound behind me. For some reason, it seemed to be coming right behind me, yet sounded so far away. I gulped as I hesitantly turned my head to the side and saw another shadow similar to mine because of the illuminating street light. The feeling of terror peaked in my gut as I halted my steps and to my horror, the shadow behind me halted as well. I don't know why, but I felt I should not turn around to face whoever it was and began to walk faster. However, the shadow moved just as fast watching my movements. I tried to shake off the uneasy feeling and reason that it was just a coincidence, but then the clanking sound got louder and closer, 
My heart was pounding in my chest as I finally turned around to face my stalker. But to my surprise, there was still no one there. I was alone in the middle of the street with no one around for miles. I stood there for a few moments trying to catch my breath and calm my nerves. As I continued my walk, I couldn't shake off the feeling of being watched. I stopped in my tracks and turned around, scanning my surroundings, but just as before, there was no one in sight. I tried to shrug it off and continue on my way, but the feeling of fear lingered. While walking, I felt as if my mind had started to play tricks on me. Every rustle of leaves or creak of a tree branch made me jump. I was hyper aware of my surroundings, and I couldn't help but feel like something was lurking in the shadows. A few minutes later, the feeling of horror returned, and this time, it was stronger. I felt someone breathing down my neck. I could hear their hot breath in my ears. My heart raced as I whipped my head around, but there was no one there. The breathing sound still vividly etched in my memory. I knew I wasn't mistaken. It could have been my sleep-deprived mind that made me hallucinate, but I can't say it wasn't real. The terror I felt was more real than anything I had ever experienced before. My hands were shaking as I fumbled for my keys. My eyes darted around, searching for any sign of danger. I quickened my pace and practically ran toward my apartment, my heart pounding in my chest. My heart was beating so fast and loud that I could hear it in my ears. I was in a hurry to reach my apartment building and quickly entered the elevator. As the doors closed, I finally breathed a sigh of relief, but my heart was still racing. I couldn't shake off that feeling of being followed. My mind was racing with questions. Was it just my imagination, or was there really someone following me? The thought of a ghost following me sent shivers down my spine. I couldn't wait to reach the safety of my apartment. As I inserted the key into the lock and turned it, my heart raced with the anticipation of finally being home. Suddenly, I felt a sudden jolt to my shoulder as someone's hand grabbed me from behind. I couldn't help but jump, thinking it was the shadow that had been haunting me. But when I turned around, I saw my drunk neighbor standing there with a creepy smile on his face. Although I was relieved to see him, his unsettling smile sent shivers down my spine. I asked him if he needed any help but he just kept smiling and slurring words. I didn't want to engage him any further, so I quickly retreated to my apartment, locking the door behind me. The rest of my Christmas night was spent in fear, every creak and groan of the apartment sending my heart racing. I couldn't shake off the feeling that something was watching me. I was relieved when the nights passed without any incident. However, my relief was short-lived when the next morning, I was awakened by a commotion outside. When I went to check what it was, I was met with a truly terrifying piece of news. My neighbor, who I met last night, had died yesterday afternoon. I felt a shudder down my body as I realized who I encountered was... Ocampo was born on March 28th. 1988 in Mexico City. It's a Codale Campo was the oldest son of two Mexican immigrants who eventually came to Seattle in the Orange County suburb of Yorba Linda, California. After spending the first 12 years of his life in the state, his parents gained American citizenship for both of them and their children. And it's cultural who would go on to graduate from Anaheim Esperanza High School in the summer of 2006. His high school friends would later remember Acampo as a warm and friendly young man, and it was this demeanor that won him many friends during his education. But something happened during his school years that had a profound effect on El Campo. The attack on New York's Twin Towers in September of 2001 Following what proved to be one of the most devastating terrorist attacks in world history, accomplice friends notice a distinct shift in his personality. 
he became dark and brooding, fostering an intense interest in the politics of the Republican Party, and particularly the foreign policies of then President George W. Bush. It was also around this time that Acampo became a victim of a rather intense campaign of bullying by what his friends later described as a bunch of rich jocks. Whether or not this affected his decision to join the U.S. Marines is unclear, but we know that as of July 2006, he was stationed at Camp Pendleton and Oceanside, where he was attached to the 15th Regiment of the Medical and Sanitary Battalion. In 2008, Acampo was deployed to Iraq with the 1st Supply Battalion to Iraq, but it's evident that he didn't see combat during his eight months in country. His job was to transport water and fuel the combat soldiers deeper in the field. And although he certainly faced all the dangers presented by an act of insurgency Acampo, was never actually under fire at any point. We also know that at some point during his tour, there was an incident in which Acampo pointed a loaded weapon at an allied soldier. Although it's not clear which nationality the soldier was, Acampo was severely punished for his indiscretion. He was demoted, docked pay, and assigned extra work duties his penance. Despite this worrying episode, Acampo still received all the appropriate commendations of his tour, including the Iraq Campaign Medal, Global War on Terrorism Service Medal, and the National Defense Service Medal. His superiors apparently viewed his outbursts as an unfortunate but unavoidable part of serving in an active war zone. Acampo was stressed he acted out, but he didn't hurt anyone and he took his punishment like a man. And it seems his later behavior is better explained by an event which occurred back in the States. After returning to Camp Pendleton, Ocampo experienced a traumatic brain injury. When the latch on his seven ton failed to lock and slammed into the back of his head, he was medically discharged at the worst possible time. Rent as the U.S. was falling into a recession, Acampo struggled to find work, eventually settling for low-paid work as a landscaper. All the while, his life fell apart around him. He discovered that his father was addicted to drugs, causing a compost mother to divorce him. They also lost the house as a result of this addiction, and the pain this must have caused its codal is frankly immeasurable. Around July 2010, Acampo began to show signs of complex PTSD. First noted when he began an exhibit, what he might call deviant behavior. A serious factor for the deterioration of his mental state was the death of his close friend Pitino, who died in Afghanistan's Helmand province during combat in the summer of 2010. Following his death, its coastal became depressed and increasingly dependent on alcohol. Over the next two years, unable to adapt to a normal life and hold a job, he depended on income from relatives and refused treatment from psychiatrists and system he was unqualified to be diagnosed for PTSD because he did not fight in combat. By the end of 2011, his mental state had deteriorated sharply to the point of developing hypochondria and showing signs of clinical delirium. Then, on October 25th of 2011, Acampo suddenly appeared on the doorstep of his old high school classmate, 24-year-old Adair Herrera. Adair lived with his 53-year-old mother, Raquel, along with his older brother, Juan, and both were present 
when a campo unexpectedly lunged at them, stabbing both Rock Hill and Juan more than 30 times. The Herrero's neighbors witnessed the murders, providing police with a description of the offender's appearance and his clothing. But because there are there no combo, were similar in appearance, the grieving of there was arrested in the shocking display of police negligence. Despite denying any involvements in the deaths of his mother and brother, he was still considered the main suspect when it was revealed that shortly before the crime, he had gotten into some kind of verbal altercation with them as per a statement from their neighbors. Just short of two months later, on the evening of December 21st, a campo was loitering about in the parking lot of a shopping center in Block Cassia, when he suddenly attacked a 53-year-old homeless man named James McGilvery. McGilvery, his bloody execution by stabbing was recorded on CCTV, and the police managed to release a composite photo of the killer in the hopes of cutting accomplice spree short. But a week later, Acampo committed another murder. This time, the victim was 42-year-old homeless man, Lloyd Meadow, who spent most of his time under a bridge crossing the Santa Ana River in Anaheim. Middle Lake McGilvery was found stabbed almost 60 times as if the killer had entered some kind of frenzy that they'd struggled to come down from. Two days later, Acampo killed another homeless man, stabbing 57-year-old Powerless Smith more than 50 times before discarding his body in the parking lot of a public library in Yorba Linda. And by the same time, Acampo killed for a fourth time. News about the homeless death in Orange County began to spread like wildfire among local and national media outlets. Then, in early January of 2012, several newspapers published a series of articles about the investigation into the killings. One included an article in the Los Angeles Times in which a reporter interviewed a 64-year-old Vietnam War veteran named John Barry, who spoke extremely negatively about the perpetrator and urged any potential victims to be as careful as they can in order to avoid being the next victim. And Barry's words signed his own death warrant. And as a result, Acampo traveled all the way over to Anaheim to begin stalking Barry. In the following evening, Bell Campo found Barry Narrow Carls Jr. in Anaheim. Then, after waiting for the right moment to strike, he attacked and stabbed Barry in front of dozens of witnesses, fleeing on foot after killing him. These witnesses obviously rushed to call 911, and Acampo was arrested while trying to dispose of his bloody clothing just several hundred meters away from the crime scene. Police confiscated a seven-inch stainless steel blade from him, one that was soaked with John Barry's blood. Homicide detectives then discovered that the murder weapon matched the one in the killings of the three other homeless men, and Acampo was now confirmed to be the Orange County homeless killer. Only later would the murders of his school friend's mother and brother tied to his maniacal spree, and after learning of his cruelty, Orange County District Attorney Tony Rakakis confirmed that he would seek the death penalty during the upcoming trial. Accomplice trial was scheduled to begin on January 17, 2004. Yet on the evening of November 27, 2013, Acampo somehow managed to get a hold of the bottle of Ajax that was found dead after having swallowed the entire bottle. It was a coward's way out a way of retaining the dignity that he had denied to so many others in his brief 
but tumultuous life? Was its code of a combo evil? Or was he a product of a broken society, suffering in his own personal hell? Who found that killing was his one true way of getting back into system? he once had so much faith in. So this story takes place back in the early 2000s. I can't quite remember the exact year. It was late December, and Christmas was just right around the corner. My family tries to spend every other Christmas together, and we rotate on whose house will host the entire family. This year, it was my mother's turn. It was dinner time, and as you can imagine, with so many people in one house, it can get pretty crowded at the table. Most everyone decided that we're going to eat in the living room. Sometimes my mother didn't mind considering the fact that our kitchen table only sat for I was sitting at the table next to my aunt with my small body. It was easy for me to sit on one side of the table with her. I had just stuck a large piece of broccoli on my fork and attempted to shove the vegetables in my mouth when it fell off my fork landing in the cup of juice that I'd been drinking. I was disappointed, but the most rational thing in my mind, I got up with the intention of dumping out the drink in the sink. But before I could move, my aunt stopped me, questioning as to what I thought I was doing. I told her what happened and showed her the broccoli that was quickly starting to break apart in my drink. I turned to go dump the cup down the sink when my aunt stopped me again, telling me not to be wasteful and fish out the broccoli and drink the juice. I laughed, thinking she was joking, telling her, you crazy, in a joking manner. But she didn't take it that way. Oh boy, did she not take it that way at all. My aunt went eerily quiet, and her face goes blank. I can instantly feel a cold chill run up my spine, and honestly had felt like I had stepped on a landmine. My aunt tells me in a low tone, Don't call me crazy. My smile had long been wiped away, and I try my best to backpedal, explaining to her that I didn't think that she was actually crazy, that it was just a playful spin on words. This didn't go over well either, because she grabbed my arm, and leaned in closer, repeating, Don't call me crazy. I instantly know that if I don't apologize, something bad would happen. So I quickly apologized to her and that seemed to satisfy her. She made me sit down and hovered over me until I ate the now extremely soggy broccoli and chugged down the cup of juice. Now, this might not seem terrifying or scary at all, well, that was just the setup for the events that were to follow that evening. Later that night, most of my family had gone out. I can't remember where, but the only people in the house were myself, my older sister, my aunt, and her daughter, my second eldest cousin. I was sitting in my room watching TV when I started to hear yelling from the remover. It quickly got louder and I knew it was my aunt and cousin. I'm not sure what it started the whole thing, but I do know why it had escalated the way it did. The two were having an argument over something when my cousin told my aunt she was acting crazy as she did the same thing I had done earlier. But unlike me, my cousin didn't apologize. She tried to explain to her as I did, but just like before, she wasn't having any of that, and my aunt exploded. I'm sitting in my room terrified when I hear a loud bang from the wall causes me to jump. After the bang came my cousin's screams of pure terror. I was too scared to move until I heard Russian footsteps. I look at my door and soon see my sister running by. Next thing I know, I can hear my aunt screaming and ranting at the top of her lungs, my sister pleading and begging her to stop, and the psalms my cousin along with a loud thud noise. I finally get enough courage to leave my room and look into the next room, and what I saw 
was an image seared in my mind to this day. My cousin was on the bed in the fetal position, trying to make herself as small as possible, just sobbing. She cried so much that she left a large wet spot on the bedspread. My sister's laying on top of her, using her own body as a shield, and my aunt is hovering over the two, just screaming like a mad woman, and in her hand is one of her shoes. It was one of those women loafers with a light sole and slight heel. She was using the shoe to beat both my sister and cousin, swinging away trying to make contact with any amount of skin. She was really just trying to get my cousin, but didn't care that she was hitting my sister in the process. I'm frozen in absolute fear, never having seen anything like this before. Sure, mother got mad at me and I got the occasional spanking, but nothing like this. I'm afraid to even say anything and fear that my aunt will turn on me and start attacking me. I slowly start to back away. When I look to the ground, that caused my eyes to widen. On the floor was my sister's jewelry box. It was all wood and had magnetic drawers to prevent the jewelry from spilling out if you knocked it over. It was just laying on the round, all the drawers open and jewelry spilled on the floor. I looked at the box, then to my aunt, and quickly figured out what that loud banging noise I heard earlier was. Yes, my aunt had thrown my sister's jewelry box at my cousin. Luckily, my cousin dodged it and hit the wall, but she had thrown it with so much force that it caused all the magnetic drawers to pop open. That's when I truly realized my aunt had lost it. I turned and ran back in my room, locking the door behind me, waiting for my mom to come home. I wasn't old enough to have a cell phone, and we didn't have a house phone, so there was no one I could call. I stayed in my room until the shouting stopped. Turns out, my aunt had just gotten tired of hitting and yelling, so she went outside smoke. My sister hugged my cousin, comforting her until everyone else got home. What bothers me most is that the entire incident was just brushed off. No one said anything to my aunt, nor reprimanded her for her behavior. I think my aunts had made it all seem not like a big deal when my cousin deserved it, and so did my sister for defending her cousin when she was in the wrong. She was believed over us, because we were kids and she was the adult. I know this isn't really as scary or terrifying as what other people have experienced, but of all the messed up things that have occurred in my life, this had one of the bigger impacts. I can't even look at my aunt without thinking about it. I will say this. My family is finally starting to recognize the true person my aunt is, that her so-called discipline was actually abuse. They refuse to condone her behavior anymore, especially my mother. Despite the fact that I'm an adult now, my aunt still scares me. But at least now, I have my family to back me up. <laughs>